Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Ducks in a Row Funeral Options 2.0. Let's go ahead and get started. I'd like to begin by saying People's Memorial Association would like to acknowledge the traditional ancestral unceded territory of the Coast Salish, Duwamish, and Suquamish nations on which we work and live. Before we could begin, just a couple of standard housekeeping items. We're going to go ahead and keep all of our participants on mute today, but don't let that discourage you from asking questions should they occur to you during the presentation. You can go ahead and drop those into the chat or use the Q&A feature. And if you're feeling a little bit shy, feel free to directly message either myself or Nancy Sloat, who's here with us today, and we're happy to uh, keep your question anonymous. Um, we will be recording today's presentation, so don't worry about frantically scrambling to grab notes. We'll make sure you have access to a recording of today's presentation, as well as my slides, so you can refer back to them if you need them for anything. If this is your first time joining us, welcome. I am the Communications Manager for People's Memorial Association, and in case you don't know, we just so happen to be the oldest and largest memorial society in the United States. We were founded right here in Seattle over 81 years ago. To date, we're the only nonprofit in Washington that provides funeral education and consumer advocacy services. But if you're joining us from out of state, fear not, we are one of about 73 organizations scattered around the country under the umbrella of the National Funeral Consumers Alliance. So it's distinctly possible there is a similar organization a little closer to your own home doing very similar work. For us, over 215,000 people have joined us over our 81 year history. And of those folks, about 71,000 of them are still living. So we stay pretty busy in the office. And when we think about what that busy looks like, one of the things that keeps us the busiest is education. Series like this ducks in a row. Uh, we offer classes and a whole bevy of free resources on our website. And uh, I'm pretty proud of the webinar library we just built up this past year just to make sure that our um, fellow Washingtonians have access to the information they need. Um, Aside from education, we stay pretty busy with advocacy work. So we do some state level legislative lobbying to support the increase of funeral choice, increase in price transparency in a historically very opaque industry, the funeral industry. And we work really hard to protect cultural rights. Uh, in Washington, we're really privileged to live in a state that is incredibly diverse in culture and race and ethnicity and history. And we wanna make sure that all Washingtonians have the same uh, equitable access to dignified end of life services. We want folks to have access to affordable cremation, burial, and now aquamation and natural organic reduction. Um, every family deserves the same right to the access of uh, services where they're getting the ability to meet their own sociocultural needs. Everybody has different ones and everyone's are valid. So we stay pretty busy. If you're having any trouble hearing me at all, feel free to go ahead and bump up the microphone, I'm sorry, bump up the speaker on your own computer and um, I will make sure to speak up as well. Okay. I'm so excited to be able to bring this series to life. It's been a few months since we've offered it, and that is thanks to Nancy Sloat over at the Seattle Public Library for hosting us. Nancy, do you have anything you'd like to say? Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I'm not sure you can see me, but I think you can hear me. Um, thank you, Beverly. So my name is Nancy Sloat, and I'm the Older Adults Program Manager at Seattle Public Library. And the uh, I work with a great many organizations um, like People's Memorial Association to partner on programs. And the library, of course, has many programs and services for adults. And my work is to make sure that we have programs on topics of particular interest to older adults and their families and friends. So in addition to this terrific series of three programs, we have a program on Medicare coming up this very Saturday morning at 10 a.m. 
Um, it's called Medicare Made Clear. Um, it's very helpful for people who are actually still uh, already on Medicare and who may want to change their coverage. Um, it's also been very helpful for people younger than 65 who are currently planning uh, when they join Medicare. Red registration is required, and I will drop that registration link into the chat in a minute after I get done talking. Um, I will also put a link into all of our programs for older adults uh, at Seattle Public Library. We call our program Next Chapter, and you will find all kinds of resources there in addition to our programs and book lists, things like that. And finally, at the end of today's program, I'm going to post a link to a survey. The library really does appreciate the feedback, so I just wanted to give you a heads up, and I'll pop back in at the end of the program to remind you. And, and then finally, if anybody would like to talk with me about older adults programming and services at the library, or if you have any questions, I will put my email in the chat right now. So thank you, and um, I'm going to turn this back over to Beverly. Thank you so much, Nancy. I just went ahead and jotted down a couple of these uh, resources you mentioned, so I'll make sure to also share those links in that follow-up email because these resources are excellent. Big fan, especially of the reading list. I myself am a big reader, and uh, Nancy and her colleagues put together a wonderful uh, couple of book lists with recommendations uh, surrounding uh, resources surrounding uh, death and dying and seems like from the outset it might be a little bit of a bummer of a read but there's just such wonderful resources and talking about death doesn't bring death we only stand to benefit from open and honest communication about end of life so just a reminder this is part of a series and if you missed our session this past week not a problem the uh, video is actually up on our youtube now i'll be putting it up on our website very shortly and it will be available to the public we hope to see you next Monday. We'll be having the last session in this series on estate planning. And so we're trying to cover all of our bases in this series just once a week so we don't overwhelm you. And uh, yeah, it's, we're really excited to bring all this to you, especially in partnership with SPL, who does wonderful work serving older adults. So welcome. Usually when you come to one of these sessions, you get um, an attorney or a financial planner or a death doula. But today I think you're going to have to settle for me. My name is Beverly and I'm the communications man uh, manager for People's Memorial Association. Excuse me, just one second while I hop over to a different presentation. There we go. Okay. Perfect. So I'm calling the session Funeral Options 2.0. If you've been following our work at PMA over the last few years, it's distinctly possible you've joined us for a previous Funeral Options session. But a few things have changed in the last couple of years, and I spiced up the presentation with some fresh new information. Uh, we have a couple of new legal disposition op options, and we just completed our biennial price survey here in Washington uh, just this past year, so we have some updated numbers to share. So a lot of work goes into all this, and I would be remiss in not highlighting some of those important findings. Okay, I'm going to start with kind of a controversial statement. I think it's really important that we remember that death is not an emergency. So just take a deep breath. And let's think about what this means. Uh, I spent a couple of years as the admin for PMA before I became the communications manager. So I have talked to all kinds of families and friends in all stages of grief and loss. And I know that we are all primed to think of death as an emergency. And there are certain parts of it that are certainly time sensitive, but with some careful and honest discussion with the important people in our support networks, we can make sure that everyone is prepared for this eventuality and we're going to get the type of care that matters to us and is, you know, honoring our wishes and our values. So doing a little bit of planning can really help reduce some of that stress and frenzy that happens at end of life. Um, we like to think of it as kind of the best gift you can give to the people you love is making sure they know what you want because they love you and they want to honor those wishes. A lot of folks ask us about the role of a funeral home. Uh, at PMA, we're not a funeral home. A lot of folks think that we are, but these are the important things you need to know about what a funeral home does. So I think it's always important to remember going into any kind of interaction um, after a death is that that funeral director works for you. And the funeral director 
could be from any funeral home, but when you're selecting that business to work with, you want to find one that's going to be within your budget and is going to meet the unique needs of your family and friends. Those folks are going to handle the body of the person that's passed. They're going to take custody, take custody of the body from the place of their death and maintain responsibility for that body all the way through the cremation process or the burial process. So they're caring for your loved one that entire time. One of the most important things they do, or at least the most useful, is that they handle all the paperwork. I'm sure if you've ever been through the process of planning a funeral before, you know that there's a whole lot of paperwork that has to be filed. And one of the most important ones is, of course, a death certificate. And I'm sure, depending on which uh, type of needs you pick, that there's different types of authorizations you'll have to sign and sort through, um, in a, like a BTP, which is a burial transit permit. And so, um, they can be a really invaluable resource, helping you navigate the different types of paperwork that need to be completed to meet legal requirements and uh, make sure that you don't end up doing too much stuff you don't need. These are a lot, a lot of these things are things you could reasonably do yourself. Um, oh, hmm, let's see, I'm still seeing the initial slide. Are there are different slides. Nancy, can you let me know uh, which slide you're currently able to see? It looks like there's a couple of participants that might be seeing a weird, hmm, weird version. Just one uh, second. I just, this is Nancy and mm -hmm. it, um, we've just gone to the second slide, role of the funeral home. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that's what was visible. I was just telling Nancy, uh, my computer lately has been in a timeout of sorts. So I just wanna make sure nothing is uh, getting messed up on that side. Okay, thank you so much. Okay. So these are the kind of primary functions of the uh, funeral director and the funeral home. You know, they're gonna take care of the body and they're gonna take care of the paperwork. And in Washington, at least, these are some things you could actually handle yourself, but for a lot of families and a lot of support systems, it makes a lot of sense to work in tandem with a funeral home to get these tasks taken care of. One of the most important things to think about when you're starting to get your plans organized and down in writing is who do you want to be the decision maker? For a lot of families and a lot of support systems, the structure that you have works really well. You know, maybe you're married and you feel confident that your spouse is going to be able to handle the decision making and has a good grasp on the things that you want and the decisions that are important to you. But maybe like in my family, I feel like if I predecease my parents, I'm not a married person. So my parents would ultimately be the person that would be responsible for making my funeral decisions. But if I were to predecease them, I imagine they would probably be having a pretty intense emotional reaction to that loss. So in my case, I decided, well, objectively, it might make more sense to put the power in someone else's in someone else's hands to make those decisions so that they can handle grief. And so that's kind of a unique situation, but a good example of the ways that you can sort of tinker with your end of life plan so that it meets the unique situation that you're in. You know, maybe you have a couple of kids and the one kid is, you know, the most organized and always takes care of everything. It's perfectly acceptable to endow that person with the ability to make decisions about your health care or your financial decisions or your funeral care. And you can split those responsibilities between people as well and even assign backups. But it's really important to put some careful thought towards who you want to have those decisions, because even if you don't choose a person, the state will. And so I've included this really helpful graphic from our partners over at um, Honoring Choices Pacific Northwest. It's a wonderful flow chart to give you an idea of where the state starts with who is your legal next of kin and kind of how they drop down to the next person and to the next person. And don't worry about trying to draw the little uh, diagram in your notes. I'll make sure that you have a copy of this diagram later on because it is a really important tool. If you don't pick somebody, Washington will. Um, Beverly, I just Chris. wanted to interrupt. We yeah. still don't. We do not have that slide. We're still on the role hmm. of the funeral home slide. Oh, that's so weird. Oh my goodness! I am telling you, me and this computer are going to have words. Okay, how about now? Yes. Gosh, I don't, thank you all for your patience. I appreciate it. Okay, let's try this again. So as you can see here, there's that flow chart I was referring to. I'll make sure that you have a copy of this slide so that you can refer back to it to kind of reason through how you want these decisions to be made. And it's really important you let those people know that you've picked them for those tasks once you do make that decision. Nobody appreciates that kind of surprise when they're experiencing a loss. Okay, so 
One of the things you'll notice actually on that last one is that you'll see um, a little asterisk next to a couple of those uh, items. That's an indication of when you need a majority. So if you have three kids and they're your legal next of kin, a majority of your kids have to come to an agreement. And in some families, that's easy peasy. In other families, maybe not as easy. Um, so if your next of kin can't agree on how to move forward or someone fails to take custody of your body or claim your body, uh, your person can stay in refrigeration for about 90 days, and then the funeral director or the medical examiner, depending on who currently has the body, will make a decision about how to move forward. Luckily, a lot of funeral homes are really flexible on this timeline. Um, but, you know, 90 days goes by faster than you might think. So, again, really important that you put a little bit of thought into how you'd like this to play out for yourself or for someone you're caring for and uh, make some contingency plans for, you know, what to do if that person dies before you or they're on a long vacation in Europe and they're not able to be reached. So here in Washington, we're very lucky to have five legal options for disposition. So effective last year, you can have cremation, you can have a conventional burial, you can donate your whole body to science, or you can try out alkaline hydrolysis or even natural organic reduction. And uh, I've made some updates to this presentation, like I mentioned, but I did try to stay true to the original presentation that was crafted uh, by uh, our executive director and it's full of these really ridiculous cartoons, but I think it really kind of lightens the mood a little. So I'm gonna go ahead and walk us through these individual options just to kind of help in your research process. Well, for a lot of folks, they haven't heard of these newer options and they haven't seen some updated information on the ones that they might've already heard of. Beverly, I'm going to interrupt again. Yeah. Again, we're still on the legal issues slide. If Gosh. you have another slide. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Hold on one second. I wonder if I can stop my share. <laughs> Try something new. Okay, how about if this is screen one, let's try on here. Is that visible for you? Um, yes, there's a slide that says the cost of cremation and direct burials. Okay, all right, let's try this again. Thank you everybody for being so patient. Okay, so. Like I said, we just completed this big project. Every other year, People's Memorial does a really exhaustive price survey where we get in touch with just about every funeral home in the state of Washington, and we figure out what they're charging for things. And we discovered that the average cost here in Washington of a cremation is about $1,600, whereas the average cost of a direct burial, just sort of a no-frills burial, is going to be about $2,900. And I've also included some information on here to give you an idea of how much that varies. Uh, for cremation, from absolute most affordable to the most extravagant that we found, there's a 745% variation on the cost of cremation and a 400% variation of cost uh, for that direct burial. So just depending on something as simple as geography, you can end up paying wildly different amount for the cost of an arrangement. Just, yeah, just simple geography sometimes has a huge impact on this. And uh, this date, all the raw data is available on our website, and I'll make sure to link where uh, we got these numbers from, because this is an important thing that we do at PMA. We've been doing it for a number of years, um, because it can be a little bit tricky to find this information, and I, I'm not the only person that thinks that's a little bit of a problem. It's part of that transparency we like to see in the industry. Okay. Here in Washington, we kind of have a pretty strong preference. Uh, about 80% of Washingtonians choose cremation, which is far and away one of the highest rates in the country. Nationally, it kind of hovers at about 52%, which is the highest it's ever been. Uh, but yeah, 80% of Washingtonians. And I think there's a couple of reasons for that. Uh, folks are usually curious to figure out why it's so high here, uh, partially because it can be really costly to bury someone. Uh, cemetery plots are very expensive in Washington and um, there's not a whole lot of them to go around. So it kind of really even further drives the price up. Uh, also, we are just an irredeemable bunch of tree huggers up here by and large. And a lot of folks opt for cremation over uh, a conventional burial because they believe it to be a more uh, environmentally sound option. And so people love the idea of having their ashes scattered somewhere they used to hike or into the sound or something like that. And so that I think is one of the big reasons that folks opt for this. 
And if that's actually something you're really interested in, the ecological uh, ramifications of a cremation, I actually have a whole video about that that we host on our website. And you can kind of get into the nitty gritty of um, what we now know actually is about the environmental impact of cremation. So it's one of my favorite subjects, but I won't bore you with it today. And so these are kind of the most common questions I get about cremation. I feel like we have a general social understanding of cremation. It's become a pretty popular option, as you can see, at least in our region up here, um, and a pretty socially acceptable option up here, which is not the case across the entire US. Um, down in the South, I was looking at some statistics that I think in Mississippi, uh, the cremation rate is almost, it's a single digit number. Um, and it just has to do with the social beliefs and just kind of the way we grow up and think about what the right thing to do with a body is. And there's no right choice. It just kind of depends on how you grow up. Um, so there's certain fam certain families um, might be part of religious traditions that would encourage folks to take a more participatory participatory role in the cremation. Um, it's nothing untoward, but just you know they might want to be there when the body enters the retort, or they might want to push the button, you know, just a last last goodbye. Um, and that's absolutely an option. Um, lots of people are kind of curious how long does it take and the cremation process generally takes about four to six hours and it kind of just depends on the composition of each person's body. Um, sometimes, you know, little tiny people might take longer than you might expect because their bone density might be different. Um, one thing that I was really intrigued to find is that um, Though it seems like a heavier person might take longer to cremate because their bodies are bigger, it turns out that our body fat turns into a sort of natural fuel. And so a cremation for a person with a lot more body fat actually goes a little bit faster, um, which I thought was just fascinating. Uh, some families want to go ahead and place items alongside their loved one when the cremation takes place. And by and large, that can be accommodated. There's a couple of limitations on the types of things you can cremate, like uh, no electronics or anything with batteries, sometimes no glass. It kind of just depends on the individual crematory and you just want to check in about that. But things like letters and photographs are absolutely an option. But one of the questions I get the most is about gold fillings. And oh my goodness, I could just do a TED talk about the types of questions I get about that. Um, so I think it's really important to know that only a dentist can extract a gold filling. And it's really tricky to find a forensic uh, odontologist, which is the type of professional that does this. They're very expensive. Um, and I think one thing that we actually, a lot of folks don't know is that the gold fillings are actually an amalgam, which is a mixture of metals. And so gold is one of the metals that is present in there, but not the entire thing. And so during the cremation process, it just burns up into just like a little, little crunchy stone, I guess. Um, it, you can't even recognize it, but it's not pure gold. So even if you uh, were to pay the fee to have one of those uh, specialized dentists extract that, uh, that filling, you really, wouldn't be able to do much with it. So I'm not always sure exactly what families want to do with them. It would be kind of rude of me to ask, but it's important to know that it's not pure gold and you're not gonna be able to cash that in for anything and it doesn't make it through the cremation process. Uh, it looks like I have a question where someone is curious about other uh, types of hardware that might be in our body during a cremation. So let's see. Oh, so the person's curious about what happens to joint replacements. And so anytime you have uh, hardware in your body, um, screws and bolts and plates and uh, joint replacements, uh, those tend to be made of titanium, uh, which burns at an incredibly, incredibly, or melts, I'm sorry, at an incredibly high temperature. And so it doesn't, nothing happens to it during the cremation process. When they open the retort back up, which is the machine that does the cremation, uh, all of the hardware is intact. And so it can just be picked out. Um, depending on each individual family, some families want to have it back. Um, other families choose to donate it to um, medical waste. The uh, products can be sanitized and um, broken down to be rebuilt into new hardware for other people. And for some folks, that's you know a pretty great legacy all on its own. It's just to put it back into the community. Um, but yeah, it stays through. It's kind of wild. Let's see if there was anything else in here. Ooh, we have some questions about scatterings. Hold on one second. Okay, so I do get lots of questions about scattering ashes, and um, I can only speak to Washington. Um, you can bury or scatter ashes on your own land. Um, you can scatter on private land with permission of a landowner. Don't be sneaky and rude. It's very bad manners. Um, and you can also scatter in national or state parks as long as you have permission. 
I'm not encouraging anybody to do anything sketchy, but um, this is a pretty poorly enforced law. So you're probably not going to get chased down, but I think it's just respectful to ask and be mindful of, you know, the ecological impact of dumping an urn anywhere. Um, I don't think the other hikers would appreciate the surprise. So please be mindful and thoughtful. Um, one thing that is important is that when you are scattering at sea, there are some limitations to where you can do that in Washington. And you know, you can scatter on any navigable waterway or from a Washington state ferry, as long as you let them know in advance and it has to be in a biodegradable container. And I included a photo of an example of one. I really like these ones. They um, are handmade paper and they're lovely and they have little bits of plants in them, but it needs to be something that's gonna break down in the water because we don't wanna to contribute to the pollution in our waterways. Um, and one of the cool things actually about notifying the ferry system, um, I've participated in some scatterings off the ferries and it's really cool. They, they stop the whole ferry, they sound the horn, they make an announcement. Um, it's really special and they issue a, a certificate with the GPS coordinates where the scattering took place if you want to come back and kind of visit the place where your loved one was scattered. And that can be really meaningful. Um, someone is curious about scattering your ashes with your pets and I don't see why not. Um, you can't be cremated with anybody else or any other animals, but you could have your ashes commingled, which means like mixed together. Um, and depending on where you want to be scattered, there might be rules about that. I know there's some religions that are a little bit, um, a little bit of sticklers about um, bringing uh, dead people and dead animals together. So it's just important to check with the place that you want to do the scattering. Okay. I tried to hide the good stuff in the middle so I could keep you guys a little longer. Um, alkaline hydrolysis is the hot new thing. Um, you might have heard this called a different name. Uh, I think this is just a fascinating process. It's uh, also on the streets is called water cremation or aquamation. Uh, some folks call it green cremation and then uh, you'll see in some legal paperwork it's called dissolution. And so this is what that machine looks like. It looks pretty similar to the type of machine that a cremation, a conventional cremation takes place in. Uh, and how does it work? Well, I'm so glad you asked. It uh, accelerates the natural decomposition process by using a combination of water flow and temperature and alkalinity. And so um, some folks have a really strong reaction to this process, like, oh my god, are you going to boil my grandma? Absolutely not. The water doesn't get that hot. Uh, it's just, you know, going to be kind of a, a warm temperature. I think that I saw some estimates of, depending on which company you work with, they all kind of have their own different balance of temperature and chemical. Um, people were saying it was like 120 to 150 degrees of uh, Fahrenheit. And there are some chemicals that are added along to aid that process of breakdown. But, you know, for a lot of families, they have a kind of a visceral reaction to the idea of cremation. They think of it as a more destructive process. And so the idea of breaking a body down by water feels more... Um, I guess more soothing and um, more peaceful. And some people do abjectly have, you know, a big fear of fire. So this could be a really great option. Um, families are kind of curious though, you know, if I do this, what happens? What do I get back? Well, you're going to get ashes back. They're very similar to, to cremated remains or cremains, if you will. Um, the breakdown of the ashes is a little bit different. It's mostly calcium phosphate from our bones. Um, it's a little bit cleaner. You won't see that same discoloration you do from the carbon during a burning process. And it's more powdery versus sandy with flame. So I got a side-by-side -side photo and I hope this isn't too gross for anybody. But on the left, you can see ashes from a conventional cremation. And then on the right, you can see an image of um, what alkaline hydrolysis remains look like. And so the ones on the left, I think are more of a texture similar to kitty litter where it's a little bit gritty and that's because there's bones in it. Um, whereas the alkaline hydrolysis remains are really fine like a talc. So you do get a little bit more back just because the reduction process um, doesn't destroy as much of the physical matter. Um, but as you can see, very similar and you can still do things like a scattering or you know keep the person in an urn. Um, so you get a lot of the same benefits of a conventional cremation, but using less energy, um, being a little bit more environmentally friendly. Um, you know, but people are also curious, like, okay, you know, I know you can do a scattering with cremated remains. Is it okay to touch these ones? Like maybe they're dirty, you know, they didn't get cleansed by fire. Um, these are actually 100% pathogen and disease free. And you can handle remains after an aquamation safely with your bare hands, um, perfectly safe. So no worries. 
And I kind of touched on this a little bit already, but there's a couple of reasons that people might choose this option, you know, a water cremation versus a flame-based cremation. And partially it's that kind of idea of there being a gentle and respectful process, you know, people think a flame is pretty destructive and you don't really want to think of something dark or uncomfortable like that when you're thinking about what happens to someone you love. And that's valid. Uh, for some folks, it's a big, um, big selling point that the amount of emissions of harmful greenhouse gases, like in a conventional cremation, is greatly reduced. Um, there's also really low energy consumption. Uh, I saw an estimate that compared this process to a conventional cremation by saying, okay, a, a cremation that's flame-based is like driving an SUV, whereas a water-based cremation is like driving a Prius. Um, and there's estimates that are suggesting that about a tenth of the carbon footprint uh, for aquamation versus a cremation. So if you are a, an irredeemable tree hugger like myself, like I said, this could be a great option for your family. Uh, looks like someone's curious about the price. Good question. Let's see. We'll get to that one actually. I thought it might be important for folks to kind of get an idea of where they can access this. We just had it legalized this past year and it became available um, I think it was just at the beginning of this year. Um, here at PMA, we were connecting folks up to a funeral home over the border into Portland to make sure that our members could have access to this resource until it was legalized in Washington. So I, I might have to find a new updated map. There's been a lot of exciting things that have happened around the country in the last year. Um, some of them good. And uh, one of those things is there's been a lot more states and territories that have legalized access to aquamation. And so you can see here the green uh, territories are places where it has been legalized. And there are um, a couple of places in blue that are considering legislation that would legalize access to aquamation. And so if you have family in other states or, um, you know, you yourself spend part of the year in another part of the country, it's, it's worth looking into. If it's not legal where you live, you can make that happen. You can get a couple of people together and raise it with your legislature and see if you can bring more choices to where you live. Um, here's a couple images of the machine. Um, I thought this might fascinate you as much as it fascinated me because it's kind of hard to imagine. How does this work? That's a lot of water. What, what happens here? So on the upper left, you can see the, um, the perforated sort of basket that goes around the person. And you can see in the bottom kind of the mock-up, the person lays horizontal inside and um, it's sealed with a gasket uh, opening on the end there. But there's that um, perforated outside. And then the person themselves sits on that kind of little basket you see on the uh, upper right-hand side. During this process though, the machine will tilt a little bit and then the water will be heated and some chemicals will be added and it's a contained process. For me, it kind of makes, I don't know, and I noticed this with a lot of other folks, um, knowing little details like this makes it a little bit easier to think about and contemplate your mortality and funerals and just like understanding those little minutia makes it a little bit easier to kind of deal with and wrap your mind around. So hopefully I'm not grossing anybody out. Again, I hope this doesn't gross anybody out, but people do ask all the time, you know, um, what happens at the end? And so at the end of an aquamation, this is what it looks like at the bottom of the basket. So you'll see there's a, a lot of um, larger pieces of bone. And so those are gonna be collected and they're gonna be placed on a drying tray like this. And depending on the facility, they might use a convection oven to heat and dry those remains, or they might even use a tumble dryer depending on their facility. And so then after that drying process is done, those, are gonna, those bones are gonna go into a machine called a cremulator and it's gonna break those bones down into small pieces. Um, I'm not actually sure about the letter of the law here in Washington, but in other states like California that require, uh, especially you know, after a cremation, that um, the bones be broken down small enough that there's no identifiable pieces. Um, that's part of their law there is that you, know, you can't have back someone's skull or um, their femur. It has to be broken down um, into a sort of a homogenous, you know, gritty texture. And so these bones are treated very similarly to the ways that cremated remains are. Okay, and just a couple more process photos for you. This is actually one of our community partners, Jocelyn from Resting Waters here in Seattle. Uh, they're a pet funeral home and they were one of the first facilities around the nation to um, offer this as a veterinary service. Um, and you can see on the upper left uh, what those ashes look like from the uh, alkaline hydrolysis. And like I said, you can still do a traditional internment and a funeral service with remains um, from an aquamation just the way you would with a conventional cremation. So it's a good option. For some folks, they're a little bit closed off to the idea because we do 
have really strong ideas about death and funerals that we're socialized about with, you know, from a very young age. And so they're kind of uh, about uh, anything new or different. Um, but I think it's important to know that aquamation is really not a new and untried technology. It's been used for many, many years successfully all over the world for both humans and animals. And, uh, and from a variety of institutions. And so I listed a couple just in case you were thinking this was some kind of mad scientist thing to desecrate the dead. I pinky promise these very reputable medical institutions have been using this process themselves for a very long time um, and using it very successfully. So I pinky promise no one's up to anything sketchy. We just wanna increase in the world more funeral options and make sure that people have access to stuff that matches up with their values and their concerns and their finances. That's all we care about. Okay, so the cost. I did see a couple people chiming in in the, uh, the chat about this. So the only one I could say with authority is that the co-op funeral home right here in Seattle does offer aquamation for about $1,250 for members. Um, for non-members of People's Memorial, it's gonna be $1,500. Right now, there is only one person in the state of Washington, one business that has the uh, equipment to perform alkaline hydrolysis. So a lot of the funeral homes are kind of having to coordinate up with him to have access to that resource. And so um, I don't have any information about other funeral homes just yet. Like I said, we did that price survey last year and then this uh, service became available this year. So hopefully we'll have data to share next year after more of these businesses have some time to kind of figure out what that cost is gonna look like for their individual businesses. So this is the only one I can offer you right now. Um, this is more expensive than a conventional cremation, but it's still pretty affordable. Uh, a conventional cremation, you know, for our roughly 25 contracted funeral homes is uh, $7.95, and so this is $12.50. So it's a little bit more, but for some families, it makes a lot of sense. It's not for everybody, and that's okay. Uh, one of the things that's kind of exciting about being able to offer new options like this is, you know how capitalism is, um, supply and demand really have a lot to do with the cost of these things, and it's pretty new, and these businesses are going to want to offset the initial cost of buying this new equipment and training their staff and this new procedure and all that. So over time, we imagine that the cost of this is going to go down a little bit as it becomes more widely acceptable and more uh, cost effective to run their businesses. So for a lot of uh, funeral homes, they're kind of having to factor in transportation uh, to that facility that's in uh, King County. So that can be a pretty long drive for people out in Spokane and things like that. So that's something to take into consideration if you do a little bit of comparison shopping around the state. Okay, and I hope you'll indulge me in this cheeky photo. This is one of our community partners, Dion Strummer. He's the one that owns the business down in Portland that PMA was partnered up with for a number of years. Uh, he is a hilarious guy. I'm really hoping that we'll be able to bring him back to do a presentation for us next month. Um, it was a really groundbreaking business to start and he is just the funniest guy. Um, so this gives you kind of an idea of the size of the machine and uh, what a cheeky weirdo he is. Um, so I just thought it'd make you smile. Let me just double check these questions before I move on to talking about a full body burial. Just one second. Beverly, somebody wants to know how long the water cremation takes. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. So I checked in with some funeral directors and they said, again, it kind of depends on the composition of your body, but uh, about two to three hours. So it's less than a cremation, um, but it's a different process. So I'm still a couple hours though. Let's see anything else important in here. I don't want to miss anybody's good questions. Um, oh, someone was curious about ashes scattering. So you can also scatter um, the remains from an alkaline hydrolysis or an aquamation off of a ferry. And there is generally, that's a, you know what, that's a good question actually, because you can pay a funeral home to do the scattering for you if maybe you're um, making arrangements for someone out of state. But I don't think that you have to pay a fee to do the scattering yourself. So that's something I'll look into. Hold on, I'm going to write that down. Yeah, I'll double check on that and I will make sure to include that in the follow-up email because that's a great question. No one's ever asked me before. Um, let's see. Okay, I think that's all of my questions on there. And please don't be shy. I promise that I have heard just about every permutation of every question and I'm not going to think you're weird and I'm not going to judge you. Um, and I, I, I worked in reproductive health before this, so I promise I can handle anything. Okay, so just a couple more questions about price here. Okay, uh, and to respond to one person that just sent something in this video uh, is, this is being recorded and I will be sharing the, um, I hope, 
Mm, yeah, it is. <laughs> Got a little worried. I didn't see the little icon. Yes, I am recording today's presentation and I will be sharing the video with everyone. Um, <laughs> Beverly, there's a question. Are there separate facilities that are licensed um, by, uh, excuse me, I can't see the whole, by the state or are they part of a funeral home for the water cremation? Yeah. How does that work? Well, so for that, um, they, as I understand it here in Washington, it's extremely rare to find a funeral home that also has a cemetery. And so usually there's going to be a funeral home that has an administrative office, and then there's going to be a care facility that they have offsite where they prepare bodies for burial or they perform cremations and aquamations. But right now there's only one facility in Washington that has the machinery necessary to do an aquamation. And so different funeral homes are partnering up with that care facility to have access to that machinery. Um, I imagine that's going to change a lot in the next year or so, but COVID has actually caused a surprising number of supply chain issues with that. Uh, we remember that when that business owner uh, purchased his machinery last year, um, it got held up in customs because they couldn't, um, nobody in the UK could get on a flight to come to the US to set his machinery up. So we're finding that's kind of putting a bit of a, a wrench in the process for people getting access to this. So we imagine that as um, COVID plays out and things change a little bit uh, with restrictions on travel, that this it's also gonna help a little bit with access to this. So, um, yeah, so every funeral home and every care facility does have to be um, licensed and credentialed by the state. Um, and I imagine that there's also some um, specific rules for um, cities and counties. Like I know that King County um, or Seattle within mm -hmm. King County has a lot of really specific rules about the types of facilities that can operate within the city. Um, like you can't build a crematory within Seattle. So there's some interesting, uh, some interesting rules you wanna um, kind of work your way through depending on what part of the state you're in. We do serve the whole state, but I'm certainly the most first in Seattle. I promise to work on that. Okay. Let me just double check before I move any further. Okay, so um, just like with a traditional cremation um, in an aquamation, at the end of the process, the bones are partially intact. Um, there, there's a crushing process. Those bones have to go through after both of those processes to break them down into ashes because we're not supposed to, uh, the funeral homes aren't supposed to return ashes to families with identifiable bone chunks in them. That would be pretty upsetting to a lot of families. And so there's a, a machine that breaks those bones down into more of a dust. Um, and so that process occurs before those ashes are given back to a family. Um, okay. Ooh, someone that's curious about body donation. I'm gonna actually save that one for a little bit later. Oh, and one more cost question. And so um, when I mentioned uh, cremation earlier, um, I had said that the average in Washington state was about $1,600. But like I said, that's only an average. It varies by, I think I said about 700% across the state. So there's some places that will offer it for substantially less, but also places that offer it for quite a bit more. And it really has a lot to do with geography. So I'm going to go ahead and share a link to the price survey that we conducted. So you can kind of get an idea of what the going rate for the services are in your area, because I can't make any promises about what it costs in your neighborhood. I can only speak to the network of funeral homes that we work with at PMA which is only about 25. Um, so for folks that are members of PMA, that cost is going to be $7.95 for a conventional cremation versus $12.50 for an aquamation. So it would be cheaper. Um, and I imagine that's going to hold through no matter what part of the state you're in is that for a while until there's more facilities offering aquamation, it's going to continue to be a, a bit more than a conventional cremation, which is widely accessible. So I hope that helps a little bit. Um, it's tough to give a good solid answer on money because everybody is from all over the place. Okay. Oh, and then someone was asking, um, I had alluded earlier that there are some functions of a funeral home that you can actually do yourself, um, depending on your patients and your bandwidth. Um, but unfortunately, you can't work directly with an aquamation provider at this time, because the only provider right now only offers it as kind of a wholesale service. So he only works, uh, his business only works directly with uh, funeral homes. Um, but you can let them know, like, I only want this function, you know, it's really important to advocate for the deceased and for the needs of your family and your care network is, um, you know, let them know this is a service I want, but these are the things that we would like to handle ourselves. And you can work collaboratively with them because remember, this is, funerals are for the living. This is for you and the needs of, you know, your sort of network of people. 
So feel free to ask those questions at the funeral home when the need comes up and to advocate for your needs because they're important. Okay. So I do want to, oh my goodness, we're running low on time. I have so much to tell you. Oh, I'm so excited. Okay, I'm gonna focus and I'm gonna save some questions for the end so I don't miss anything. All right, I wanna jump into full body burial just for a second. Cause I know this one's kind of, nobody ever joins these uh, presentations to talk about burial. Everybody's here to talk about composting and I know it. Um, important though, people call all the time and they want to know, can I be buried on my property? Unfortunately, you can only be buried on land that's established as a cemetery. And so if you'd like to be buried on your land, you have to formally have that land zoned as a cemetery. And that process can look wildly different depending on which county in Washington you live in. And it can be very costly depending on where you are. It's important also to know that embalming is not required. It's not required in any state in the US. Unfortunately, some less, uh, uh, less transparent and less honest uh, Funeral businesses might imply that it's required, but it's it's not. So if this isn't something that you truly want and you need, um, you, you don't have to do it. Um, and important to remember that there are some benefits available to veterans. They're pretty limited and sometimes the paperwork can just be truly exhausting, but national cemeteries are free for veterans. We included a photo down here of our own national cemetery at Tahoma. Uh, what a view, isn't that just incredible? <laughs> Okay, something that I've been really digging deep and learning a lot about is green burial. Um, and it's available in Washington. Uh, one thing that we always say at PMA is that uh, when people ask us, what's green burial? It's, uh, we always like to respond with there's shades of green. Um, so there's different ways to take a sort of environmentally friendly approach to your funeral arrangements. And again, I wanna just keep saying, I'm not making a value judgment about any of these options. Whatever is right for you and your family is right for you. There's no best or better options. The best option is the one that fits your needs, okay? Um, but for some people, it's really important that they go out of the world um, by kind of writing a love letter to it. You know, like, I don't want chemicals in my body or I don't want to be placed in a container that's going to live on forever. I want to be in a biodegradable container. I want to touch the soil. And that stuff is beautiful. And you should absolutely do that if that's what your faith requires or your personal values do. And so there's some really wonderful conservation cemeteries around Washington. Um, you know, they'll place you directly in the ground. Some places, you know, they'll only, they won't allow you to erect like a typical headstone. They'll want you to use a rock or a native plant in lieu of a marker. And it's just, it makes for a beautiful place to visit. And I've included a couple of examples of what we mean when we say biodegradable container. There's some wonderful businesses that handcraft these uh, containers, like you can see on the left, uh, a, wick, a wicker casket, like, oh, it's just so beautiful. Or down on the bottom right, then, you know, this hand-sewn shroud, like that is just wonderful. And these are made out of natural materials that'll break down over time and be returned to the earth. Okay. I have to tell you a couple of boring legal things, so humor me. You need to remember that buying a plot is your right to burial. It's not ownership of the land. So the cemetery is a private business and it owns the land so it can make the rules. Um, they can make all kinds of restrictions if they want. It's their property. They can say how many people are buried in the plot or they can require uh, a grave vault or a liner, which is like a cement box that goes around a casket. Um, and it supports the ground. So when the lawn equipment drives over, it doesn't um, sink down and squish the soil. It can make all kinds of rules about the size of the type of monument that you place there. Um, and one thing that I think is really interesting is that they're currently not required to provide you with price lists. And so they can make you jump through some hoops to find out how much stuff costs. And depending on your patience level, again, and your bandwidth, that can be really exhausting if you're trying to shop around and figure out what's a good fit for your family. They might require you to physically come and visit them to uh, get that kind of information. Uh, where the 1984 funeral rule that was passed, it's the only federal uh, funeral law, um, requires any funeral home to share their price list over the phone. Uh, we're working on trying to get it by email, but um, cemeteries aren't beholden to that same law, which is really interesting. Okay, let me just double check my questions here before I pass on to the good stuff. Okay, um, someone is asking about a particular cemetery in Spokane. Um, I 
don't recognize this facility, but if you're interested in learning more about who our contract providers are, I'll make sure I link our, um, our website in that follow-up email. So you can kind of take a poke and see if maybe there's uh, something on there uh, that meets the needs of your family. Okay, I'm gonna save that one for a minute. Okay, just wanna make sure I don't steal too much of your afternoon. I know everybody's got places to be and I too can see the sunlight peeking out and it looks lovely. Okay, so I'm pretty sure that natural organic reduction is the only reason anyone wants to talk to me anymore. Uh, you might have heard this call by a couple of other names. So the, one of the big businesses that's doing this is called Recompose. So you might have heard this called Recomposition or Human Composting. Um, these folks were founded in 2017 as a public benefit corporation. They used to be called the Urban Death Project, and these are one of our community partners. We love working with these folks. Uh, this project was a collaboration between the Western Carolina University Forensic Anthropology Department and our own Washington State University. So this process was legalized back in 2019, and they just opened their first facility here in Seattle this past year. And this is kind of a, a mock-up of what their facility was supposed to look like before COVID kind of threw a wrench in everybody's plans for everything. And so right now they're working in a temporary, um, a temporary space. I'm not sure in which part of Seattle I haven't visited yet, um, but they are serving families. And um, it doesn't quite look like this, but I know that they're actually working to move into a much larger space to serve as many folks as have expressed interest in using their services. Um, I wonder... Gosh, okay. Well, I thought I had a slide on here that was going to show a little bit more about the process, but I can tell you about it. And in the future, I'll make sure I have more diagrams. Um, so this is a fascinating process. And again, I want to remind you, this is not a new, a newfangled thing. Uh, it's certainly something that's been in process for a long time. Um, the creator of this particular project, uh, though there are now um, three businesses here in Washington that are offering uh, natural organic reduction, which is the legal name for this process, um, the first place that opened was Recompose. And um, so I think they kind of get dibs on a couple of the concepts here, like inventing. Um, at least for the uh, person that runs Recompose, Katrina Spade, uh, this came out of a project that she was working on in grad school as an architect student and deciding to maybe take a critical eye to the type of uh, death care that's available in urban spaces. And, you know, if you live here in Seattle, you know that real estate is more than at a premium. Uh, it's just, it doesn't even exist. And so for people in those dense spaces, what do their options look like for um, funeral options and memorial options? And so one of those things was, you know, what if we applied a process that we already used for animals and helped create a disposition option that actually allows us to really literally give back to the environment? And so for folks that, uh, you know, really are um, into the idea of becoming a tree or, you know, um, I do trail maintenance myself. And so the idea of turning into soil is just like, oh, so perfect. Um, you know, really being able to, you know, nurture the land that you love. Um, this is a great option. Um, these, this image you can see where the honeycomb shape, um, each of these cylinders is a vessel. And so a person will be placed inside the vessel um, with some, a couple of different plant types of plant matter. And so it's effectively composting a person. And if you've ever tried it in your own backyard, you know, it's a pretty uh, delicate process to get some, you know, nutrient rich soil to take care of your garden. And that's what this produces is nutrient rich soil. And so um, each business uses kind of a different balance of alfalfa or straw or flowers or all those things and these vessels rotate periodically to make sure the soil is well aerated and nurtures that breakdown. And so this actually allows that body to break down over the course of a month. And so at the, at the end of a month, you have a vessel full of super nutrient rich soil. And uh, as you can imagine, a person turns into a lot of dirt. Um, about, from what I understand, it's about like a pickup truck bed full of soil. And unless you are a hardcore gardener, you own a big uh, piece of land uh, to use that soil on, that's kind of a lot. And so they do have a really great option for taking a, a token amount home and then donating the rest of that soil. Um, they've been working with these folks down in Bells Mountain in Southern Washington to help rehabilitate some of the land that's been uh, damaged by development and poor management over the last you know, 50 or 75 years. And so this donated soil is helping to rebuild that forest and that is just, oh, it totally speaks to me. Like I said, irredeemable tree hugger, that's me. So this could be a great option if you're kind of thinking, wow, that's, that's perfect, that's exactly what I want. 
Um, so personally, I'm very emotionally attached to this process. I think it's just fascinating. Um, and this used to be how, I mean, it continues actually to be how um, livestock is cared for. And, um, you know, I guess it just was like, well, what if we turned that same process into humans? After all, we're all just mammals. And what can we do to give back to the earth that nurtured us and cared for us in life? And that's a pretty cool attitude to take to your death care. So what draws a lot of people to this process, like I said, is that environmental impact very much speaks to them. Um, but people are worried about the cost and it's pretty recently available. And so people don't have a lot of information about the experience, like what to expect out of it. And so I did kind of allude to those price ranges before. And so just to kind of look at it across the board, uh, remember conventional burial is gonna vary wildly across Washington. It can be anywhere from 8,000 to $25,000, just depending on where you look. Uh, a cremation can be as low as 750, but as much as 7,500. And a natural burial, hmm, excuse me, depending on where you go, can range from 2,000 to $8,000. So the folks that recompose, they are a licensed funeral home. And so the cost of the service is gonna be $5,500. Um, they have offered to provide members of PMA a discount, um, which might make a little bit of a dent in that for you. But I think one of the things that's really helping a lot of folks out with the financial planning side of things is they do offer a payment plan so folks can stock away a little bit of money over time to slowly pay off that if this is something that's important to you but you're not sure how to make it financially accessible. So I think that's pretty cool. Um, let's see if I've got any other fresh questions in here. Um, okay, so someone's asking about the names of the other two facilities that offer this. There's one in Wakiakas called Herland Forest. Um, and I don't know the name of the other one because they haven't opened yet. Um, I think there's I want to say that they're going to be in Auburn, and I think that I had heard they're supposed to open this summer, um, so I don't quite know what their name is just yet. Uh, they just invited our executive director for a visit, so I'll have to check in with her and see when we're going to find out more information about that. So just a nice photo of trees. So if this is um, a particular process that really speaks to you. I mean, I read about this obsessively because I think it's interesting, but I don't speak for that business. And so if you do have technical questions or, you know, you'd like to learn more about this particular service, I would really strongly encourage you to visit their website. It's very cool. Um, and ask your specific questions directly to them. So that way you, um, you know, get the best answer from right from the horse's mouth. Um, let's see. Oh, so someone is asking about natural burial, and they want to know, do all cemeteries offer it? And they don't. Um, it depends on each cemetery. And uh, if you have a cemetery that, you know, you kind of like, like personally, I have such a crush on this, the, uh, the historical side of Evergreen with Shelley. Ooh, I just love it. Um, touch base with them and see what their options are, because uh, a lot of cemeteries are starting to see this is, it's not going away. Uh, green burial has been around for, gosh, millennia and uh, it's kind of going through a renaissance right now of products and services and different places offering them and so you'll even see conventional cemeteries starting to um, set aside a portion of their property where they do green burials so if you have someone in mind I would touch base with them and see what their plans are. Ooh, okay, that's a good question. Someone was asking about donating that soil uh, to Bell's Mountain. And they said, is there a cost to donate that soil or is it included? I don't know. I'm gonna write that down and ask as well. You guys have the best questions. Beverly, there's also another question. Is there a cost to transfer to the forest the decomposed soil, or is it included in the cost? No, yeah, so that was the one I was just thinking of. I actually don't know the answer to that question. Um, yeah, I'll have to uh, touch base with them and let you guys know. I'll include it in the follow-up email. Oh my goodness, it's already three o'clock. You guys have so many good questions. Oh, all right, let me slam through these last couple slides and then we'll try to get to as many questions as possible before Nancy kicks me out. And um, I'll make sure to include some extra information in the follow-up email to make sure nobody leaves here with too many unanswered questions. Um, so these are the decisions that you know, you're know you gonna be poised to have to make uh, maybe in advance for yourself or for someone you care for. And um, you're pretty much in charge. You know, you want to make sure that you're making the decision that's right for you individually. Um, it's really easy to go into 
planning a funeral and feel pressured either explicitly, you know, by a business person or just socially pressured to make certain choices. And I think it's just important to keep asking yourself who this is for. Um, so, you know, maybe you're making the decision between having a funeral versus a memorial. A funeral, the body is present, but a memorial isn't. And maybe you'd rather have a celebration of life anyway, just because it's more cheerful and true to the person. Um, you know, you might be forced to make a decision about, okay, this person wants to have a conventional burial. What are their feelings on embalming? You know, what kind of casket? Um, maybe they were just kind of a no-frills person. They didn't want everybody fussing about it and they don't want a service. Or maybe they're very old school Catholic and they want it, all the bells and whistles. You know, they have cultural traditions that, you know, you got to respect. And one thing that makes a little challenging is if there weren't enough choices and a lot enough decisions to make, COVID really puts a damper on things, don't they? We've really been forced to rethink the kind of the ways that we grieve and celebrate. Um, you know, you might or might not know there's a lot of limitations right now around the country with the types of services that are available and largely centering around our ability to gather in groups. And so I know myself, I've lost a couple people in the last year, and it has been really challenging to bring folks together to do that. Um, so that's certainly going to plan to it. And if you are doing some advanced planning or you do have a loss that you're trying to grapple with right now, you're going to want to touch base with the funeral home and see what kind of limitations there might be on the way that services are delivered. Um, by and large, it's been my experience that a lot of funeral homes here in Washington are working really hard to compromise and do what they can to meet your needs. Because, um, you know, they're, they're invested in you making a, having a good experience um, as good as it can be. So... I don't know, shoot for the moon, ask for, you know, the craziest thing you can think of and then scale it back a little bit to reality, I suppose. Don't, don't be shy, this is for you. Um, and something else, you know, it's not for everybody. Some people get really squeamish at the idea of home funerals. This is it's a great option for a lot of families. And I think that I've seen a, an increase in requests on information about this during COVID since we are a lot of us um, working across great distances. And this might be a great way for us to find a newer way maybe for our family to engage with the death process. So it's called, kind of called participatory death care, where we have a hands-on approach to end of life and funeral services. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you're the person that washes or dresses a body. Maybe there's something else that you can do that normally you would think the funeral home handles, um, you know, and the needs are different for everyone. Some folks want to keep a body at home so that it can lie in state for a couple of days. And that's an option. You know, in Washington, you are going to need to either choose to embalm that body or refrigerate it and that could be even using ice packs to keep that body at home just to slow that decomposition process a little bit you know and maybe it's something as simple as you want to be the person that drives your mom to the cemetery and that's an option so I think it takes a lot of really good open and honest communication with the people in your support system about you know what matters and uh yeah, what you can do. I think I always encourage families, you know, don't feel pressured to make an exact decision on things like, all right, here's the casket I want. Here's the outfit I want to be wearing. This is where I want to be. This is, you know, these are the verses I want read. I encourage people to write a values statement. So you talk about what matters to you. What are your values? Like, okay, maybe at your time of death, you don't have enough money in your estate to afford recompose. But, you know, you want your family to remember how important the environment was to you. Like, remember how I protested against nuclear power and I went hiking every day and I always recycled my rainwater. You know, you would write in your values statement, like, the environment matters to me. Do whatever you can to reduce my carbon footprint or do whatever you can to give back to an organization that mattered to me. And instead of giving specific instructions, you can give general ones about what's important to you. So that kind of gives your family a little bit of wiggle room to make some choices, um, you know, with some compromise. Like maybe they can't quite afford what you wanted, but they can do something that honors the spirit of what you want. And uh, let's see, gosh, I've got a couple more questions in here. Um, personally, I'm a big enthusiast of full body donation. If, uh, if you can, it's a great way to give back. Um, there's a couple of uh, institutions here in Washington that do accept donations. And um, someone did actually ask in the questions about donating your body to science. You can donate your entire body or you can donate some of your tissues. Like maybe you just wanna donate your corneas or just your organs. You can spell all that out. Um, there's a here in Washington, our cornea donation uh, nonprofit is called uh, Sight Life. And the organ and tissue donation is called uh, Life Center Northwest. And so if you're thinking you'd like to be an organ donor, 
you're going to want to reach out to those folks and figure out what the process is for documenting those wishes. And you can still donate the rest of your body, or you can still proceed with a conventional burial or an aquamation or an alkaline hydraulic. I'm sorry, I already said that one. Uh, you can do anything after you donate. So don't worry that you won't be accepted for whatever the funeral arrangements are just because your body isn't complete or intact. Um, it's, it's a wonderful gesture to be able to donate those things as you know your gesture um, towards humanity. Um, if that's right for you, I would strongly encourage you to look into it and really spell out what your wants and needs are because you don't have to give everything, you can specify. And um, you can also specify, I, you have to specify actually which institution you would like to donate your body to. Let me check out that question there. So there's a couple places here in Washington and I would strongly recommend if you're thinking about this that you reach out to them long before you need it. Um, there is, I think, three universities here in Washington now that are accepting full body anatomical donations. You can see uh, the University of Washington is one, Washington State. There's also a, uh, a university here on the west side called Bastyr. Those folks accept anatomical donations as well. And each one does have their own uh, sort of criteria and process for how they manage that and they all have med schools and so if that's something you're into reach out to those folks and see what that process is like. Um, we're really lucky in Washington to have such a generous population here that they actually get more donations than they can handle so they can afford to actually be a little bit picky about the types of folks they accept. So I always suggest you have a backup plan in case at the time you die they already have enough donations and they can't accept you. So put a little bit of thought into that as well what your backup plan is. Um, you can also donate your body to a mortuary school so that future death care professionals can learn from you. Um, our local one here on the west side is called uh, Lake Washington Tech, and that's where funeral directors go to school. There's also some for-profit donation programs. I don't know as much about that because uh, I tend to just work with other nonprofits, but um, I promise I'll do a little bit of work on that side and see what I can find out for that. But for most people, when they think about donating their body to science, they kind of prefer that it's going to be an educational institution and not that someone's going to make money off of um, whatever they collect. So, okay. Okay, so these are, the, these are those two businesses I was, or those two organizations I was just mentioning. Make sure you reach out to the specific organizations and talk about the process and make sure you discuss this with your family because they, they won't know if you don't tell them. And um, so the process is that, you know, if you, uh, if you die under circumstances under which these tissues can be collected, um, that would be done before you go to the funeral home. So the funeral home wouldn't do that part. Um, and the funeral home can wait as long as necessary for those processes to take place because they know how important that is. Um, so you'll stay in the medical care facility until it's time for your body to be picked up. So there's no rush. And I think this is kind of a question that everybody's like a little bit afraid to ask because they feel like it sounds kind of crass, but who's responsible for the cost? Well, it's going to be that next of kin based on that chart we were talking about earlier. Or it's that designated agent, and that's the name of the person that you specifically pick to make your funeral choices. Um, that money might be pulled out of the estate of the person that dies, but if when you die, you don't have any money or any assets. Each county has a program for indigent cremation, but very little money for it. And yeah, I hate the term indigent cremation. It's pretty thoughtless, but sometimes stuff happens and you, at the time that you die, maybe things aren't really on the up and up for you financially. Um, one thing is, you know, we do have a cremation assistance fund here at PMA. Again, a very limited fund, but we're trying to do what we can to, again, make uh, funeral arrangements as accessible to Washingtonians as possible. And sometimes things happen, you know, we know that and we try to do our best to help where we can. And again, I think this is another thing that people feel kind of icky about, but there's no other purchase that you would make that's this costly where you wouldn't shop around. And so please shop around for funerals. One of the great advantages of doing your planning ahead of time and having these conversations with your family ahead of time is that you're not going to be pressed for time in making decisions if they already know what you want. So funeral homes are required by federal law to provide you with a general price list. If you come to their office during COVID, I think you're going to find it's a little bit uh, tricky to make those appointments. And so they should give you a quote over the phone. They're supposed to. Um, it's increasingly common for funeral homes here in Washington to put that price list on their website. It's actually up to 51%, which is a huge jump. The last time we did this survey back in 2018, it was only like 36%. And so, like I said, we do this price survey every other year. So the funeral homes know we're coming for that price list. And so we like to think that we've had a little bit of impact on that transparency in the industry. 
And I think you, I think you all know this, you know, what are the factors that kind of come into play when we're choosing which of these funeral homes all over the state to use for these services? Price is going to be a huge part of it and don't feel ashamed of admitting that, okay? Quality, of course, and reputation. Uh, I saw someone mention in the uh, questions, you know, how do I know about independent ownership or if something's owned by a big corporation? It can be really hard to tell. Going on their website's a great option. Sometimes you can see in the footer that they're owned by um, a corporation like Dignity Memorial or um, SCI. That's a, another huge international business that owns a lot of funeral homes. Um, it can be tough. And you can ask them, you know, are you guys independently run or are you owned uh, by a corporation? If that's important to you, then that's something you should seek out. And there's a lot of value in doing some research up front about that stuff. And a big driver is certainly going to be location. You know, um, if you pass in Spokane, it might be a little tricky to get you back home to Seattle for, you know, to go to the particular place you wanted. So again, I think it's important to make some backup plans and talk to your family about what's a good compromise if they can't provide you exactly with what you wanted. Um, and one of the biggest drivers in which, which business you work with is do they offer the services that you want or, you know, do they have the kind of facilities necessary to provide what you're looking for? Oh, goodness. I thought I removed the silly animation, but just a reminder, <laughs> um, it seems kind of weird, but you can use things like Yelp to look at reviews of funeral homes and get an idea of what that business is like from other folks that have used it. You can use Google reviews. You can search the Better Business Bureau. Treat this like any other big purchase. You know, if you buy a car, you buy a new appliance, you buy a home, anything like that, you're going to do your research and treat this with the same same scrutiny. Um, it's not shameful to want to do that. And I think that, you know, we've all been socialized to think that it's a reflection of how much we cared for someone to spend a lot of money. And it's not. Going into a whole bunch of debt to do something, um, it just puts you in a lot of debt. Um, so I, there's just such an incredible amount of uh, opportunity out there to make sure that your family doesn't go into a lot of debt honoring someone they cared for and a lot of opportunity to have open, honest conversations that are incredibly valuable. Oh my goodness, this silly animation. So think about it, talk about it, and put your wishes in writing, please. Discuss with your next of kin or your designated agent what you want. Where do you keep the papers that say what you want? Do you have funds set aside to pay for these? Engage with your family. So many of us are so uncomfortable. Like, I don't want to talk to my kids. They don't want to hear about it. Or I can't bring this up with my mom. She hates the idea. You've got to do it. It's just get it over with. Complete a disposition authorization that specifically states your wishes. Get that designated agent form filled out. And have the conversation. It, it's going to be awkward because we've all been socialized. I think the death is just this great taboo, but it doesn't, talking about death doesn't summon it to you. Um, a lot of us have that sort of superstition and you just stand to benefit from getting the type of end of life care that you want by talking about it. You know, none of us are mind readers. And uh, gosh, we're so running over time, but there's just so much important information to share with you. Um, I think the short answer, should I prepay, is no. Um, of course, everybody's financial decisions are their own, and you should certainly make them in coordination with your spouse or your kids or your financial planner. But prepaying for your arrangements means you trust someone else to properly manage your money and take care of these things correctly when you die. And we have the great fortune of living much longer lives than we ever have. Um, but funeral homes aren't locking in prices, and... Um, I think a lot of folks anticipate that by prepaying, they can lock in those prices. But funeral homes know that we live such long, healthy lives now. Why would they lock a price on when you could live for another 40 or 50 years? It's not a good business decision for them. Um, but if you have to prepay for maybe a, a spend down for Medicaid, then maybe looking into an irrevocable prepayment is advisable. And that's something that takes a little bit of Googling and a little bit of uh, paperwork. So these are kind of the three major ways that people handle the financial planning side of this. Um, if you want to learn more about this, I'd strongly suggest you come to the estate planning class next week because there's just so much important financial information there that I could never do justice. It's well outside my wheelhouse. Um, but yeah, funeral trust account, a pay on death account at your bank, or a life insurance policy. So remember, People's Memorial encourages you to think about what you want, talk about your end of life wishes for the, your loved ones and your support team, and put it in writing today. There's no better time than today to do it. And then you can rest in peace. Oh, I just love that joke. Okay, Nancy, you've been wonderfully patient with me stealing so much of your afternoon. Do you have anything that you want to say? Um, no, I just wanted to say thank you to everyone. And um, 
I know that uh, Beverly will be looking at all of the questions if we didn't get a time to uh, for her to answer them and um, she'll be able to answer them also in some of the follow-up in the follow-up email that she'll be sending um, Beverly there's also information that people can directly contact people's memorial correct absolutely I'll make sure that you have a couple of different ways to get in touch with us uh, like I said we're an education and advocacy nonprofit so it's literally our whole job to answer these questions and we're happy to do it so you're never going to be an imposition there's so many good ones on here thank you so much for all being so participatory you have great friends Nancy Wonderful. All right. Well, like uh, Nancy just reminded you, I will be sending out a recording of today's presentation with my slides. I know I kind of slammed through the last couple of those, but um, I just I don't want to steal your whole day when the weather is this nice. So I'll make sure that I um, kind of dig through the chat and through the question and answer and make sure that anything that I didn't answer in the course of today's session is included in the um, in the follow up email and get in touch if you still have some lingering questions. Um, you know, this is it's what we do, um, you know, and I, uh, I'm not the only one at PMA that's going to try and make you laugh a little bit while you talk about something that's kind of uncomfortable. So, you know, please don't hold back. We've heard every conceivable question and we're never going to judge you. Um, we know how, how tricky it can be to find good quality information from reputable resources. And that's why we do what we do and why we've been doing it for over 80 years. So thank you so much for joining me today. Um, it's been a real treat to talk to you all. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.